Um, this is a special meeting, so, uh, or an emergency meeting, so the format would be a little different. Uh, my expectation for this, we have one item on the agenda for, I guess, uh, technically it's two items. We'll be hearing a resolution and also learning about, hey, thank you, learning about a um, plan uh, for an agreement with the county commission. So the way I see this going is we will have staff tell us what the resolution is. Um, and then we will have uh, members of who I've invited who are the CEO of Wesley Hospital, as well as a medical uh, doctor to uh, give us uh, a background of pretty much why we are where we are. And then we will open it up to public comment at Century 2, uh, so that the public can speak at Century 2. Now, I believe we've agreed that we will have, um, for public comment, three minutes instead of the standard five minutes, which is uh, a set precedence from before I was elected uh, with the anticipation of large crowds when we had a public forum on baseball. So I'm hoping to keep it to about three minutes for public comment so that we can wrap up around 11, because my understanding is another council member uh, has a meeting that was scheduled before this that they must get to, uh, so we want to be courteous to that council member. If for some reason we don't have a vote by then, uh, then we will delay the meeting until uh, we, we, uh, the council member returns. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and have a reading of the call of the meeting uh, by the clerk, Madam Clerk. Resolution allowing enforcement of an Sedgwick County Resolution 154-2020 in the City of Wichita and Government Enforcement Services Agreement between Sedgwick County, Kansas and the City of Wichita. Mayor, Madam Manager, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, members of the Council, um, we're here today to consider um, an action to, in support of uh, a November 13th order uh, that was issued by the Cedric County Health Officer. Uh, in that order, um, there were a number of actions that were to be taken. Uh, one is to require mask and face coverings for anyone in public space, uh, requiring businesses and organizations to uh, inform uh, members of the public and their employees about the need to wear masks uh, in their facilities. Uh, requirement of a six-foot uh, social distancing in public spaces and a, limiting, a limit of a hundred individuals uh, uh, for mass gatherings. The, an enforcement mechanism for this ordinance was, or for this resolution, excuse me, was approved by the county commission and right now that only applies to uh, unincorporated Sedgwick County. In order for the order to be enforced inside the city of Wichita, Council needs to approve a resolution, which is in front of you today, as well as an enforcement agreement. Um, the resolution uh, indicates that the, any violations of the health order will be prosecuted in Sedgwick County Court, uh, that the violations themselves will actually be written by county staff, and then the enforcement agreement indicates that the city will provide assistance in reporting any violations as uh, they occur. Uh, are observed or as we are asked to uh, investigate. However, city staff will not be actually writing citations, they'll just be reporting to the county counselor's office and the county counselor then will make decision on uh, action. Um, in, in working with the county manager, it's their intent to, for uh, first time violators to issue um, warning letters and to work on education with any business uh, or individual that is um, been reported uh, before they ever get to the point of citation. However, for serious violations, I believe the next step, which will be determined by the county counselor, will be uh, the issuance of a citation and uh, a court resolution. Uh, so with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions regarding the items in front of you today. Um, the uh, city attorney also is available for questions regarding the document. Are there questions on the resolution at this point? Councilmember Fry. 
Thank you. Um, so, Bob, just reading through it and um, just a couple of questions. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it says in it that um, any uh, complaints will be received by the Cedric County Health Department, and then they will review it, issue warnings, and then they will decide if they need to have our staff, being WPD and WFD, to visit the premises. Is that the chain of command? That, yes, it is. Um, so it's not, <clears throat> do we anticipate a number? How many are we expecting to visit and observe? Really don't know at this time. When we had the mask ordinance, uh, the, I would say we had weekly inspections of uh, bars and restaurants in Old Town, but because we do that anyway, in terms of actually investigating individual complaints, I don't know that we had a lot. We did. In, uh, issue a, a number of letters, warning letters, but in terms of actually going out to locations, I think it was primarily um, uh, bars, and it was outside of Old Town, it was, would have only been a handful. And is there a time frame as to when this ends? Does it follow the order that Dr. Mintz has established now? Uh, no, this stays in place so that it, if Dr. Mintz were to issue a subsequent order, that it would remain in place through his So it would orders. follow whatever order Dr. Menz decides to do related to anything health, public health. That's correct. Well, that's correct. We can, um, we can revisit the issue um, as we get further through the um, outbreak and the council can rescind this. And I'll let the city attorney talk about that. But my understanding, the council can rescind this when it deems that to be appropriate. But it's also maybe extended to any other outbreak or any other public health issue that MENS would decree. It would follow that as well, correct? Right, and, and again, I, I'll let the city attorney address that. If, you're, if you want to limit this to public health orders uh, dealing with COVID-19, the outbreak of COVID-19, I think we probably could fashion that. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm way. just asking, I mean, giving a blank check to someone who's not an elected is kind of un uncharted territory. Uh, I will, yes, I, I understand that. I, I will remind you that the only way that we got to this point is the county commission had to approve an enforcement ordinance. And so right now, um, you're coming alongside the county commission more than you are the health officer. Okay. But again, that doesn't have a time limit either. Uh, or does it? Their current, uh, no, not, not their enforcement resolution. Right. I think the current order does, but okay. right. Um, and then if officers would have to appear in court, um, if there was a citation issued or, or a violation issued, um, that would be on our expense or would that be reimbursed by the county for the time spent when officers are in court? That would be in our, in our, that would be our expense. However, we've set up a process that their report should be sufficient evidence for prosecution and we would not so, need to appear in court. Would not have to appear in court, right. okay. Uh, and are, is the county anticipating hiring any extra staff for this uh, code enforcement officers? I don't believe so. Um, I really wish they were here today to answer some of these questions. I'm yeah. surprised they're not. Yeah, well, it, it's probably my fault for not asking them to be here or being a C2. So um, I, um, uh, it's my understanding they are not adding staff. They did add some staff with COVID-19 funding to help with contact tracing and other administrative duties, but not in terms of uh, an ADPD. Okay, that's all I have for now, thank okay, you. Thank you. So I have a follow up. No, it might be actually for legal. Um, the previous speaker mentioned that we're on uncharted territories by accepting within our city uh, the, an order from the county health uh, inspector that was approved by the elected body at the Cedric County Commission. Uh, is that true? My understanding is this law was uh, put in place in which we had to allow, uh, I guess, health orders to take place in our city. That was something that was approved this less than a year ago uh, during special session. Could you comment on that? I think it's uncharted in that I am unaware of any time that the city has consented to the enforcement of a county resolution within the city limits. Because before we didn't have to, it was automatically applied, is that correct? The county resolutions are only otherwise authorized in the unincorporated areas of a county. So it's, it's the, I think it was House Bill 2016 that was passed at the, this year at special session 
that required us to opt in, you're saying that that bill just solidified previous law. If I recall 2016, and I don't have it in front of me, um, that bill required counties to opt out of a health order, uh, of an executive order of the governor. It didn't address the city's um, authorizing enforcement of a county resolution within city limits like this does today. This is a different action. Okay. Does a county health official have the ability to, I guess, temporarily close a um, establishment uh, in within city limits without the expressed approval of the city council? I believe county health officials have orders, have authority to do some, you know, actions like that. I don't know the extent without looking at the Kansas statutes on health officers, but I believe so. So they do have authority within cities that are incorporated um, even before COVID. To some degree, yes. Thank you. Other questions on staff for the resolution? With that, I will recognize uh, Mr. Bill uh, Bolch. I'm sure I messed up your name, and I apologize. Bolch. He is the CEO of Wesley Hospital, which is our second largest um, hospital, uh, regional hospital here in Wichita. Uh, so if you would uh, approach the podium and just give us a bit of an overview on why it's um, why we're here today. Why are we looking to have the health um, the health order from the county uh, be applied and enforced here in our city? Sure, what I, what I would like to do is, is speak to uh, what's going on at Wesley from a hospital operations standpoint, what we're planning for. And then um, I would like um, my chief medical officer, Dr. Arbasol, to um, share the opinion of the medical staff on um, on the restrictions that should be applied throughout the county and the city. Uh, so my name is Bill Volich. I'm the president and CEO of Wesley Healthcare. I've been uh, CEO for seven years, or six years. I've been at Wesley for seven. Uh, and uh, my hospital is, uh, is overrun with COVID at this point. We have, uh, uh, yesterday, as of yesterday, we had 115 uh, COVID positive patients in the hospital, about half of those in the ICU. Currently, we have five of our units that are full of COVID or pretty close to full. Uh, we have two ICUs um, that are full of COVID and uh, three med surge floors that we're housing the, all of those patients on. And um, we are um, at that point where we are unable to uh, take on much more. Um, as I rounded through the unit yesterday, um, uh, many of the nurses uh, pleaded with me to continue to express the concern that we have on our health system being able to handle an increase in volume. Uh, based upon our current spike and numbers that we're seeing, we are projecting 195 to 200 um, COVID positive patients by the end of December. Uh, great concern around Thanksgiving gatherings and Christmas gatherings coming up. Uh, we, uh, we have been able to um, staff the hospital uh, to this point adequately. Uh, however, uh, every bed at Wesley is full every day. Uh, we are unable to take very many transfers from outside of Wichita and outside the county any longer. And we've been closed to all out-of-state transfers for literally weeks now. So we are a regional health center that, that we, we get a lot of, of our patients from outside of the county and outside the city. And we've had to shut down to all of those requests as of late. Um, my concern isn't for where we are today, per se. Um, I think today we're handling it okay. Um, if this is the top of the spike, great. Uh, I am very concerned about what we're seeing and uh, very concerned about where we will be by the end of the year, uh, given the trajectory that we're seeing uh, in the community. Uh, and so with that, uh, I would like to have Dr. Ebersall speak to the medical staff's opinion because I am not a physician, and uh, I would never comment on what we should be doing from a medical standpoint. So, Dr. Obersall. Doctor, the floor is yours. Bill, thank you. Mayor Whipple, thank you for the invitation to come speak to the, the city council today. 
As Bill mentioned, my name is Dr. Lowell Ebersole. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at, at Wesley Healthcare. I've been there for almost two years. And I'm here on behalf of our medical staff, uh, which is about 1,200 members at Wesley, and to offer uh, the medical staff's recommendations uh, around uh, restrictions in our community given the, uh, at this point, almost exponential growth of COVID-19 over the last uh, several weeks to months. As you all know, we're up to I think, over 28% of 14-day rolling average of positivity in our community, in our county. So one, more than one in four people that are now being tested, and I would stress, those are the only the ones that are being tested are now positive, are positive for COVID-19. And these uh, people are throughout our community. They're, they come into our hospital, they come into the grocery store, they go to restaurants, bars, and and uh, sporting events, and so we wanted, uh, again, the opinion of our medical staff and the recommendations are the following. First would be to uh, shut down, close all bars and nightclubs. Second is to, uh, for restaurants, uh, to uh, stop in-person dining, and all restaurants should, would go to uh, takeout only. The next is to uh, close venues that hold large gatherings, uh, we, Bill and I, and, uh, and I'm sure many of you, hear of weddings that are continuing to uh, occur. A uh, facility, a uh, hotel in town hosted three weddings this last weekend. Um, next would be to uh, uh, discontinue uh, winter sports. Uh, given that uh, we're moving, sports are going to be moving in, indoors uh, for the winter. And this would be applied to both uh, public uh, schools that are associated, uh, those associated events, as well as private events. There are club sports that are occurring in venues across town where there are literally hundreds of people within the walls of these facilities, um, many of which certainly are not wearing masks. Overall, we would recommend that all gatherings be uh, 10 or less people. Uh, when you, and then associated with that, we would recommend that as we come to the holidays, we have three of the most beloved ho holidays in America, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's coming up. And we'd rec strongly recommend that families gather only as immediate family. Uh, and this means sacrifices, I understand that. Um, not being able to potentially see your you know, grandparents or your parents or other loved ones. Um, I, I think of this certainly as, um, as an individual, as a citizen of our, of our city and our county and our country. Uh, I have a family as well. I want to see my loved ones, but I also want my elderly parents to be safe and healthy. And so the contact that, that my family has with them is uh, very, very limited uh, at this point. I'm also uh, a physician, and I think of this as, uh, in terms of what it is, is a public health crisis and emergency in our community. And so I think about, as Bill and I and others plan for what is occurring right now and for the future, I go through all the worst case scenarios and that's what we're planning for. But there will come a point if uh, the, the growth continues at the current pace that we will just not have any further capacity to care for these patients. That's capacity from a physical standpoint with beds, from a staffing standpoint, uh, in terms of nurses, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, physicians, EBS workers. Um, so I, again, thank you for your your time this morning, allow me to speak to the, the council. Would you, uh, either, both of you mind standing for questions if there are any? Absolutely. And, and first, I just want to uh, have a clarification. We, uh, when it comes to recommendations as a medical professional, uh, those, those get reported uh, for, for, the, for the media who's here, but our purpose uh, today is to uh, not implement any particular recommendations, but to allow the county, the Board of Health, and their medical team to, um, to, to lead the way when it comes to uh, healthcare policy that, that hopefully gets these numbers down. So I do want to make that clear for the people who, who are watching that today our resolution is to 
uh, really solidify what was the council's intent last time we talked about mass, which was to allow the elected officials over at the Cedric County uh, to, uh, to, to take the lead when it comes to, when it comes to healthcare policy. But I, I do want to ask about, so I'm going to remind everyone to quorum. If people are talking, then you, you will be recognized on the floor so that you can uh, speak. Um, but when someone has the floor, please don't make sly comments or be distracting to our guests or to those who are running the meeting. So I am interested. I'm asking for decorum for people not to make sly comments when someone else has the floor so that we can be respectful of each other as there is a process in gaining the floor. So I was just speaking to our guests and asking questions and my line of thought was interrupted because someone made a comment that was a violation of our decorum. So I'm asking that we maintain decorum. With that, I would be interested, if I could continue my line of questioning, be interested uh, to know what, because it's not just beds, what, can you tell us more, I think a lot of us look at the beds, and we look at the charts, and they're, they're real, uh, and some people actually say, why don't we just make more beds? Um, can you tell us more about the staff, about what's happening with staffing, and what the nurses are going through, and the doctors are going through, who are treating COVID patients, and uh, just give us a bit more of an insight on, on that aspect. Certainly. So I'd start with the, just be, beginning with the volume. Uh, this, the, the numbers of patients that we have at Wesley certainly is, uh, it is higher than we normally have this time of year. We do have, we do have surges in our volume. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a flat line throughout the year. and We, we prepare for the winter to have uh, somewhat of an increase. But the, the difference with COVID-19, or one of the many differences, is that, that it's sustained. And it's this sustained, um, very critical patients that are continue to come to Wesley and have now actually increased uh, dramatically over the last several weeks to a month. And these patients are very complicated and very sick. And uh, as Bill mentioned, 50% of our COVID patients on average end up in our ICU. And they, uh, they are uh, requiring intense levels of care. I'll paint a little mental picture for you on a patient that's on a ventilator, which is a significant intervention for these patients. Standard of care is to prone these patients. And that means that they're typically on their back so that we can help uh, aerate their lungs better and them, them to improve. We, t we actually turn the bed, we turn them over in the bed. This takes about six to eight staff members to accomplish this safely because the patient has a breathing tube, they have central lines, all these uh, monitors attached to them. So this is done twice a day and that takes all of these staff to, to do this. Nurses are, when they go into a COVID-19 room, they have to don all, put on all the appropriate PPE and maintain that appropriately and that sterility. And then when they leave that room, that has to all be taken off in an appropriate manner as well. They're wearing N95 masks constantly. They have, you've seen pictures, they have you know, breakdown of their skin from, from this. So there's the physical aspect of it and then there's the emotional toll that it's taking. Because as healthcare professionals, we deal with death and dying on a daily basis and we're, we become used to that to some degree, not numb to it, but now d death and dying is occurring much more frequently in our hospital due to COVID-19. And to, the other layer of complexity to this is that these patients, uh, due to, pr to protect their own family members, we do not allow visitors into these rooms. So we are committed that no person and no patient at Wesley will die alone. So that means a nurse or a therapist or a physician is sitting with that patient, holding their hand while they're dying. And they may be on, you know, we, we use technology to connect the family via um, an iPad to, to look at, you know, if they, they wish to do that. They are 
out uh, in our waiting area with our chaplain services and support staff. So I think that's just a, a brief description of what our staff are going through on a daily basis. We have uh, EVS workers uh, that go in and clean these rooms that are putting their, their health at risk uh, to keep, uh, to cl deep clean these rooms so that they can be ready for the next patient. Uh, we, our staff are volunteering to do this. There's a young man that in our EVS department that volunteered to clean up in our MICU, which is our, our first uh, COVID unit. And then I would talk about um, both the nurses and physicians, the toll that it's taking uh, from a, again, from a mental and physical standpoint. Uh, we have, we brought in counselors to work with them, uh, to uh, therapists to talk with them. Um, again, they have stepped up uh, dramatically. As Bill mentioned, we, uh, our nurses uh, have uh, picked up hundreds and hundreds of extra shifts over the last uh, several weeks because the, we typically would bring in travelers and we are doing that, but everyone across the country, all hospitals are seeking out traveling nurses. And so the, the pool of nurses is limited that we can bring in. We are blessed that we are part of HCA Healthcare. Wesley is owned by HCA. It's a very large health system. And so we do have access to those resources uh, to bring, uh, you know, bring those uh, resources to Wesley. And just, and then I'll get to, we have a couple members who are on the list, but I do just want uh, to ask probably Mr. Volch, what happens if we stay on a current trajectory? Uh, right now we're at capacity, we're very, very close to capacity. We, there's no, at this point, enforcement mechanisms for policy design to try to lower these numbers uh, here in Wichita. What, what happens if we do nothing and the reason to believe it, by doing nothing, the, the trajectory will continue to rise? Uh, what, what will happen to our hospitals? What will we be facing as a community? Well, once again, I, I, uh, I don't have a crystal ball, right? But based upon projections, if we just hit what we think is going to happen with no interventions and we get to 200 patients by Christmas, that would create a need for another 90 hospital beds um, I, uh, I and my team have come up with a way to potentially add 30. Uh, we think we can get 30 um, hospital beds added. Uh, that would leave 60 additional patients that we are going to have to find a home for. And so we will have to go to alternate places like our PACU, which is our recovery area for surgery, um, and, uh, you know, other alternative sites. You know, it's possible we may have to treat patients for long periods of time in um, outside of, you know, in the hallways of Wesley, um, that certainly is possible. Um, I, I think we can probably manage uh, to care for everybody inside at 190, I think. Uh, it's very concerning if we get to that level. However, uh, I'm worried that 190 to 200 is not the top end, right? If it, if it gets to 250, 300, that's where I get concerned. Uh, we, we, are, we are bringing in all sorts of resources over the next month to prepare for that. From physicians, we're actually even bringing in uh, uh, additional physicians from outside, asking our current physicians to stretch even more, bringing in nurses, bringing in ancillary support, all of those things to try to plan for that. But it is gonna come down to physical space and where we're gonna have to treat those patients at. Because uh, you know, treating patients in a tent outside in the parking lot, it, it just isn't very feasible. There's there's no systems in a tent, right? And so, we need to have everybody within our four walls in some form or fashion. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes Councilmember Fry. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I sympathize with what you both gentlemen are going through right now. Uh, I totally get it. Um, sensitive to it. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of chatter in social media. A lot of people are asking questions that, honestly, I don't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. You've kind of addressed it a little bit already, talking about uh, preparing and capacity and what you've been doing recently. Mm -hmm. um, there's questions about, well, wasn't this expected at some level that there was going to be a second wave? And were you not doing all of this leading up to it? And it's now 
critical oh. and you're oh. just now doing this? These are not my questions. These are questions that I'm seeing on social media. Sure. Um, there's questions about um, elective surgeries and elective mm -hmm. procedures and are, are we delaying those so that you do have additional, and I know it's not apples to apples, mm -hmm. right? But when we talk about not enough nurses, not enough resources, not enough beds, I trust you're doing everything in those measures, but I think the public needs some reassurance that there has been these steps taken and it's beyond what you've planned for and we're at that next stage where this has to be done. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Sure, I'll speak to part of it and I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Sure. Obasol to speak to part of it. Um, as far as planning goes, we've been planning for this since March. Uh, and so we've had plans to surge up higher. The, our plan hasn't changed since March. So on March 16th, when we got our first patient, um, nobody knew and nobody still knows exactly how high this will go. I, I mean, to, to say that I know we're gonna hit 200, that, that is an absolute um, educated guess, right? Based upon the current data that we have. Uh, will we hit 200? I sure hope not. Um, but uh, the plan has always been that there will be a second surge. Uh, we, we did a really great job back in June and July of slowing um, the spike. We did a great job. And I applaud everyone in this community for that. We had, um, after the 4th of July, which was the last major holiday that we saw the spike, about three weeks post that, we hit about 45 patients in house, and that was, that was manageable, and we were doing fine. Um, I think at that point, um, through August, September, October, we saw us uh, get tired of it all as a community, and we, we let our guard down. And so what's happening now is somewhat expected given um, the fact that we had let our guard down a little bit, and, uh, and so now the numbers are higher than we expected because of that. That's why we're here today. And so, uh, yes, we plan for it. However, you can only plan for so much. At some point, the numbers get significantly higher than you even plan for. Um, I was, uh, uh, early in early March, never thought we would get to 200. I, I really believed that based of all the projections and the numbers that we would stay under triple digits. But now here we are at 115, doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, it's, it's rampant across the country, not just in Kansas. Um, and we need some intervention now in order to keep us from to getting to 200. So to say we are just planning now and we just woke up and decided it was a problem, that just isn't accurate. I mean, my, myself and my team have been planning for um, a really long time. And so um, as far as um, uh, elective surgeries, I'm gonna let Dr. Obersall talk about that because that's more of a medical question sure. than a possible question, so. So uh, certainly a very appropriate question. And I would just add to the Bill's comments that we have a crisis care committee that's made up of our senior team, uh, administration, and our medical staff leaders. We've been meeting weekly since March. Uh, so this is to be, be prepared. We discuss all of our, our plans. Uh, we, I would say that over the last uh, month to six weeks, we've had to adapt to some changes within the organization. We've had to adapt to COVID-19. You know, I said yesterday, and we were invited to speak to the county commission, that uh, co this medicine and COVID-19 are dynamic. They're constantly changing. We're learning, and so we're adapting to what we do in terms of taking care of these patients, and we're adapting within, you know, from an operational standpoint at Wesley as well, because some of our staffing uh, issues have changed. Uh, so we will continue to do that and adapt and uh, move forward so that we're best prepared uh, for uh, the con what we expect in terms of the, the numbers of patients. Specifically around surgery, we have a, a, a surgical governance committee that looks at these cases. Uh, right now we are uh, one of our uh, vice president of uh, surgical services and our uh, chief of surgery review these cases on a daily basis and uh, look at them to see do we have um, number OR bed, you know, ORs to do these cases, do we have appropriate staff, and do we have beds uh, if for the, there's a percentage of these patients, a number of them that need to be admitted. The majority of them actually are outpatient surgeries or a short stay and they can go home so they do not require a bed. Uh, so we, that, right now we consider, you know, there's three uh, stages that we have at the hospital uh, 
we're in our conventional uh, mode at this point. So it's, uh, it may not sound funny, but uh, business as usual, but it's not business as usual, but we're able to operate in that space. Next would be a contingency uh, status, and then after that would be a crisis status. Uh, so as we, we continually assess that, it's literally on an hourly basis, sometimes even minute by minute at the hospital, senior team is communicating and then operationalizing these uh, things as, as, a, the as the situation warrants. I would just like to follow up real quick. Um, <clears throat> recent family experience at Wesley, non-COVID related. Uh, the staff, I could tell they're stressed, uh, but everybody did a great job. And I want to thank them all and thank your staff and all, all responders across the city right now doing this work. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Tuttle. Thank you. Um, my comment questions are towards staff, so I don't know if it's appropriate to do that now. Is that okay, Bob? Okay. There are further Thank you. questions for... That's what I was going to ask, if anybody has any more questions for our guests. Uh, thank you, and you're, you're welcome to, to stay with us if you like, in case there's other questions that come up, or if you have to go run the hospital, we understand that as well. Okay, last call for questions for staff. And for medical staff. Oh, very good. Thank you all for being Thank here. You. We really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for what you. you're doing. Thank you for being here. Councilwoman, the, the floor. Thank you. Um, and, and I think this is probably towards Bob, but maybe Jennifer, but um, the fifth bullet, it just, I had highlighted it before, and I just have a question again. Um, out of the six things that were included in the Cedric County Health Officers Emergency Public Health Order, the fifth one is entertainment venues with capacities in excess of 2,000 people may not host events unless the local health officer has approved a written plan from the venue subsequent to November 13th. So the way I read that is if I turned in a plan and it was approved, let's say in October, I can still hold my wedding with 500 people in December or January. And, and I'm, I'm just, the only reason I'm asking, and I know it's theirs and there's nothing we can do about it, but I just worry about confusion and then I worry about people making a lot of calls about something and, you know, like, is there going to be a list that's provided somewhere so that if somebody calls and says, you know, the Johnson family is having a wedding in December, the person answering the phone can say, yes, that plan's already been approved so that we don't initiate staff to go out and address it. I'm just trying to be proactive, I guess, if you will, if that makes sense. That's one concern I have. And I just have one other, but if you want to. Yeah, I, I, Council Member, um, a little read, little reading of this language out of the, the county's own order is outdoor and indoor entertainment venues with capacities in excess of 2,000 people may not host events unless the local health officer has approved a written plan from the venue subsequent to the issuance of this order. It makes me question if any event would be allowed unless it has authority. Okay, because the, and, and you know, again, I'm, I don't have a lot of angst with that. I'm just trying to be, you know, proactive. But the way I read it, that if my plan was approved in October and my events in December, I can still have my event. So that just might be a point of clarification that we need to make sure so that we don't send staff out for something that's already approved and, and perfectly fine to be happening. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And then my other comment slash question, again, I don't have a great deal of angst, but just wanted to bring it up. Um, I was going to ask about the sunset, so thank you to Council Member Fry for doing that. And the way I heard what you said was that our enforcement to support the county, and, and I want to emphasize again that on October 27th, when we addressed this the last time, I said that I didn't think that we should be doing any work in this area unless the county requested us. So now we're being requested to assist. So, but my fear is, is the way I heard it, and maybe I heard it wrong, is that it's a blanket, we will help support the county. It's not just these six items that we see in front of us today. So if they pass another resolution tomorrow, we would also enforce that. 
not saying that we don't want to be supportive, but what if we don't have the capacity to be able to support it? So my, my preference would be, and I don't want to have a bunch of extra meetings and a bunch of time, but if they pass something else, I think we need to look at it and say, yes, that's something we can actually do. I mean, what if they pass another resolution and it's something that we don't have through our police, fire, MAPCD, have the capacity to assist with enforcement? Does that make sense? It's, it's hard for me to pontificate what they're going to do next to say that, yeah, we can for sure support it. So I, I just want to maybe highlight that and bring that up as a question slash concern. Yeah. And I see others nodding their heads, so maybe I'm making sense. Uh, um, council members, I, I understand your concern. Um, it was, again, I'm just going to repeat that the primary enforcement responsibility falls on the county. So it's a matter of us being in a support role and... Uh, helping when they do not have the ability to, to enforce um, with health staff or MABCD. Um, we purposely wrote the, uh, the, this language um, so that it didn't have to come to the council every time there was a change in the order. And because this is such a dynamic situation, I could envision a council getting together, it could be, at least in the sh short term, it could be every two weeks. Um, and we were trying to avoid that. Um, this doesn't say that we're going to in, that we're going to be able to go out to every complaint. It's much like I mean we have to recognize the pressures that we have on our police and fire as well as MABCD, our shared service, and we'll do what we can. But we, it was always intended that we would go, we we would get involved with repeat offenders and those that are really the most serious violations. And we have both police and fire that will be helping in that regard. And thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And I understand the need of the, the intention of not wanting to have you know, a bunch of different special meetings. I don't think we need to, to do that. But just want to be cognizant of the fact that our police, fire, and MAPCD are probably overwhelmed and also dealing with shortages because of COVID. And just want to make sure that we don't overcommit for something that we can't follow up with. So. Um, thank you for that, and I appreciate your explanation. Bob, can you speak to the collaboration uh, efforts, not only behind this, but moving forward, so that um, do we have, uh, when you and the manager talk, or when these come out, is there that, that uh, collaboration happening with the city and the county so that concerns, uh, like the ones that the council member brought up, can be addressed before an order comes out? Uh, Mayor, yes, we we talk and or, or communicate on a regular basis, and um, he uh, the county's been really good in terms of uh, keeping uh, our office informed of uh, changes uh, and issues that they're wrestling with, and it would be a collaborative discussion uh, or a, a joint discussion if there was a, uh, some concern about us taking on a greater role, and I. I think the county clearly understands what it is that is in front of you today, and that it's not that we're in the primary role, we're in the support role, and that we, but we also recognize we're in that serious, you know, um, health crisis. And so um, it, it is an important role for us to play, but um, if, uh, th if there were going to be a significant change in the order, I'm sure we'd have some consultation before um, uh, that would be brought forward. That's good to hear. And just a follow up, uh, when previous council member with her line of question made me uh, want to ask, uh, as the, the city manager, you are ahead of the administration of the entire city of Wichita, uh, serving longer than any of us have. In your professional opinion, uh, do you believe that we do have the administrative um, resources to come alongside the county with an order like this? and? Be able to uh, have an assistant role uh, with the county without being stretched too thin. Mayor, in, in terms of the enforcement effort that we have outlined with the county to date, yes. Yes. And then again, as I said, if, if there were to be a more stringent order and um, a request for us to get deeper in, involved in reporting or enforcement efforts, I'd have to judge that based on their request. And in those situations, you would, you you would would of course bring it up with the council. And uh, in a situation like that, uh, if we had a more stringent order, we would always have the option to revisit the issue uh, if we needed to. 
uh, from the bench. Is that correct? Uh, yes, because in, the, in that case, it would have implications on the budget as well as on probably public safety response. Excellent. All right, Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I forgot that I had read this earlier. There's been so many documents uh, back and forth uh, through email and so forth, but the resolution that we're being asked to approve today, resolution number 20-369, has item number five where it says the city of Wichita reserves the right to rescind this resolution and any agreement to enforce orders of the Sedgwick County local health officer following 30 days written notice to the Sedgwick County clerk. So that does give us an out in terms of that open, never ending enforcement. Would that take an action by the council at a meeting to make a change or would that be just done administratively? Council member, after you asked me that question, I went back and looked at the agreement and found the same language. Um, I, I would interpret that as meaning the action of the council. I okay. would take that. I don't believe that would be appropriate for administrative action. Okay, thank you. Further questions? There's no further questions at this time. I will relinquish the floor to Century 2, where I believe we have um, three people uh, who have asked to speak to this item. Uh, so with that, the chair recognizes the good staff at Century 2. The floor is yours, Naomi. We are calling them in. Hold on just one moment, please. Welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Excellent. Thanks. It's just one, I believe. So um, if I could get a little more in three minutes, that'd be great. Um, but if not, that's fine, too. Are the I was wondering if the medical, uh, if the CMO and CEO are still there. Uh, sadly, they are not in, in a public forum this, uh, usually. Okay. It's well, I do have some questions then that I'll just throw out there that um, as they were speaking, just struck me very interesting. And I think it's important for the public to see and understand. Um, one of the things, you know, I know there's some overwhelm going on with COVID. One of the questions I would have is how many of those patients came in with COVID symptoms to begin with? I know we're testing everyone once they come in. So, um, you know, once they test, then obviously they're getting put in the COVID situation and, and that stat. But how many came in because of COVID symptoms? that now we have this COVID situation. They also said that we typically have an increase this time of year, but now it is larger. I would wanna know how much larger is that increase? Uh, also, the CEO said that we did a great job in June and July. I actually coach baseball here in town. I have two baseball teams. One didn't make it, one did make it this summer. And we were doing uh, tournaments and practice all summer long through June and July. And I'll tell you, those tournaments were packed. And uh, for him to say that we were doing well with complying, uh, those we weren't complying there. And uh, so for him to say that we were doing better then than we are now, I just don't believe that that is the truth and the reality of what was going on. I've been in our community a lot since this all went down and it has gotten tighter and tighter. So to give that the credit, I disagree. Also, Dr. Minns, when he uh, enforced an order at the end of, um, well, when things were starting to come down, he gave credit. He said, one of the main reasons I feel that the numbers are coming down is because of compliance from our citizens and enforcement from our businesses, okay? So he gave credit to the mandates, to the restrictions for it going down. So what I would want to know is why are the numbers going up if we've gotten more restricted, we've had more compliance going on uh, than we've ever had before. So it's just a question. Um, the other question that I have is, or the concern or thought is with the masks. Look, certain masks do work. They work for a certain period of time. Uh, if we properly take care of them, they can work, I get that. But all of us have been out in public. We've seen what's going on. We see how people are wearing them. We see how people aren't. I mean, I'll just ask you guys, when was the last time you washed your fabric mask? When was the last time your children washed theirs? You know, I got this surgical mask. I put it on so that I could come in, right? Are we wearing this over and over again? Or are we replacing it? If someone was infected in here and I'm in here and I'm breathing in one side, someone's breathing on the other side and that's now infected, I go to another place, I drop it somewhere, now that goes with me and it goes with me and it goes with me and it goes with me, right? And how many, how long are people doing this for? So my question that I have for you, and this is kind of what I'll, what I'll wrap up, and I have a lot I could talk about, 
Um, and I have a lot of people I'm speaking for right now with this emergency meeting. Not a lot of people can make it because it was less than 24 hour notice. I could barely make it and I have a very open schedule. Uh, so I, I'm not too much of a fan of that, but I get it. Here's the deal. With the proper, the way that we're doing this mask, 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 mask mandate, the way that people are showing up in our community. And by the way, you putting more enforcement on it, that's not going to change the game. It's just going to make it's just going to make more businesses police this situation. It's going to create more friction in our community. It's going to create more division in our community. And it's it's putting uh, responsibility in places that it's not supposed to be. We have bus drivers, we have school teachers, we have people doing their job plus being enforcers and police women and men to make sure this stuff's getting done. And they're not getting paid for that. And it's not their responsibility. The point is, here's what I'll say, is that I want you to think, is it possible? And I want to ask the medical professionals this. Is it possible that the way that we're doing the masks right now, that it's doing more harm than good? And if any of you, if it's just possible, if you say yes, it could be possible, then for you to stand behind this stuff and continue to stand behind any type of mandate or resolution or enforcement of it, that that's on your hands because it's possible that the masks are helping. It's possible that these mandates are helping, but it's possible that they may not be. And the numbers show that. And if we're giving credit for the numbers coming down, well, what are we giving credit for the numbers going up? If we've been more compliant, which we have been more compliant, you can try to justify it and say that people haven't, they have been. All this stuff that that CMO wants to close down, close this, close this, close that, all those things were open when things were going well, when numbers were coming down, all that stuff was there. So now we're gonna shut it down when the numbers go up and say that's the reason? So I we, get it. He's we a gave you an extra He's minute. Can you wrap up your thought? He's look out for his medical team. I get all that. I understand it. But we, you guys are making decisions for the entire community, not just for a hospital. And that's how we have to look at it. And I'm trusting you all as leaders to look at it that way. And if you can't answer a no, is it possible that it could be doing more damage than good by the way we're actually doing it? Not the theory. It's how we're actually doing it. If it's a yes then you need to let this resolution not be passed. That's my opinion. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hey, good morning. Uh, so, you have three minutes, but we'll probably give you an extra minute, so go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, hope, hope everyone's having a good day so far. Uh, may, may it's just the morning, but you know. Um, so before I get into my question, I want to uh, time travel back in time to when mass mandates were coming into place by elected officials. And this was when the uh, Wichita Police Department just kind of wanted to just blow off the mask mandates as because they have uh, like other priorities uh, to enforce and or uh, they didn't know exactly what what law to cite or find someone for. So, so that being said, uh, going forward, assuming that the enforcement that you guys are voting on today, my question is, how will it play into law enforcement uh, to, uh, enforcing it and, and finding or citing people who who violate it, as opposed to last time when they just kind of blew it off? Uh, I, ho I hope I hope you have time to answer that question. So the way the format works is you present and uh, all you're presenting to the chair, which is me, um, and there's no questions unless a member asks to answer the question. So this is your time to present and the purpose of that is so that we don't pretty much filibuster your time. Uh, we wanna make sure that, that during open forum you have time to present everything you would like. So uh, please continue your presentation. All right. Um. Well, I think that was, I think that's all that I had to say. I mean, if, if uh, I understand the whole filibuster thing, so um, that's all I, that, that's really all I had today, just a, a couple of questions that I had in mind. But uh, uh, just, I will just say one thing that I really hope that going forward with the vaccine being distributed as we speak, um, I'm just hoping that we can get it distributed and available as soon as possible for our community. So that, so that way we can avoid a lockdown for any kind of business or school. Uh, so that's all. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. There are no further speakers at Century 2. There are no further speakers. 
Very good, then. Thank you. We'll go ahead and bring discussion back to the bench. Uh, more discussion on the resolution. If there's no further discussion on the resolution, I will uh, make a motion that uh, we pass the resolution out. Is there a second? Mayor, if second. I may. You made a motion for the resolution. Is it your intent to make a motion to adopt both the resolution and approve the agreement at yes. this time? Yes, uh, my apologies. Um, I revise my motion to uh, pass out both the resolution and the agreement uh, at this time uh, with a single singular vote. Uh, so if the vice mayor who seconded uh, still supports, uh, then motion has been made and seconded. Is there discussion on the motion? Uh, <coughs> Councilmember Fry. Thank you. I just want to make sure, does the resolution number need to be identified in the motion so that it's clear? Um, it, it would be helpful. I don't think it's essential because we do have an agenda item that states it, but for the record, it would be... Um, right, but the agenda item refers to Sedgwick County resolution by number. It doesn't correct. refer to our resolution by number. You are correct. The clerk was good enough to give us a resolution number before this meeting, so um, if that could be stated, that'd be helpful. Or, or you could simply do, I think, what you do many other times, and that is a recommendation, a approval of the recommendation as outlined by staff. Okay, Which, I just was making yeah. sure that we were approving our resolution, which re references their resolution, so. So it's clear as mud, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I like I actually like the technicality. Um, yes, I, why don't we go ahead and uh, I make a motion that we um, that we take st staff recommended action uh, to pass both the resolution and the agreement as listed on the agenda. And authorize all necessary signatures. And authorize all necessary signatures. And do we have to emergency this up? This is not an emergency ordinance. This is not merely ordinance. a resolution and an agreement. And I will note that the agreement will not be effective unless and until Sedgwick County Board of County Commissioners approve the agreement. Excellent. All right. Just making sure I didn't have to make this motion a third time. Maybe that was number three. Uh, motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by the vice mayor. Um, further discussion on the new motion. Um, Council Member Tuttle. Thank you, and I know this is going to be a bit redundant, but just because of the emails that I've been receiving in the last 24 hours, I just want to make the comment again that this is not going beyond what the county is doing. Um, I know that our health um, care folks came today and, and made some other recommendations, and at that this point, it was not addressed by the county. It's not being addressed by us. So we aren't, we aren't adopting anything today that's in addition to what the county has done. The county serves as the Board of Health, and, and I believe it's our responsibility to partner with them and to try and support them when we're able to and when we have the capacity to do so. So just want to emphasize to the community that everything that's happening now is just an enforcement mechanism, but no additional action is being taken. So hopefully that'll answer some questions that we've been getting via email from our constituents and community members. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? See none. With that, uh, we will ask the clerk open the rolls so members to cast their vote. Mayor, you'll need uh, the verbals. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Um, so from the, so we'll, we'll go ahead and close the roll. Be uh, asking. We'll, we'll start with the verbals uh, from Councilmember Clendenin. I believe that was a no. I didn't hear the volume. We're doing a roll call vote. Councilman Clendenin, I believe, said no. Uh, Vice Mayor uh, Claycomb. I think that was a yes. The volume's off, okay. Uh, so with that, we will um, close the roll and present the total tally. It looks like uh, with a, oh, I wanted to read, sorry, I was going to read it. Motion passes, I believe it was um, Council Member uh, Bubog and Council Member Clendenin who are our two no's. Uh, with that, I will entertain a 
All right, we'll make a motion that we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded by the vice mayor. Any discussion on the motion? See none. With that, clerk will open the roll, members we'll cast the vote. Oh, and roll call vote. Um, to adjourn, uh, Council Member Clendenin. I think that was an aye. You guys should use your thumbs. Uh, Council uh, Vice Mayor Clayco. Uh, let the record show aye. that um, Council Member Clendenin and Claycomb Comb have voted aye to reserve, uh, adjourn. Uh, with that, uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you all. <laughs>